Um, how about Northeast Portland, the clinic there, uh, Planned Parenthood of Columbia and the William Met, and also I think I checked, and as far as I can tell, same for Planned Parenthood of, the Southwest, of Southwest Oregon. Prenatal care, I couldn't find it anywhere on any of their offerings. Infertility treatment, didn't see it anywhere with women's services or pregnancy services. Adoption referrals, they mentioned that they discuss, discuss options. I don't know whether they've actually referred into adoptions. But they do mention that abortion is not 3% of the services, but 5%, um, which means that they're likely responsible for considerably more than a third of their revenues. So it may be even, the, the, the proportion that they get from abortion may be even higher here. I don't know because they don't publish uh, the uh, exact number of abortions or their prices. All right, let's talk about what's going on inside the clinic. What's the abortion pro the, uh, process like? According to Planned Parenthood, they come in, they will discuss a woman's options, look at her medical history. She'll be given a pregnancy test, a physical exam. She may, uh, in some places, be given an ultrasound. Uh, she'll read and sign papers and then have her schedule the abortion. Now, types of abortions that, that are done. Now, there are a, a lot of different types of abortions. And if you uh, wanted to get more detail about different types, you could look at uh, the publication by the National Right to Life Committee, which we have called Abortions and Medical Facts. There's also a little fact sheet online you could look up there that has different types of abortions. Uh, and I think it's on our website. But basically, from what I can tell, there seem to be two different types of abortions uh, that are done in this area. There are some surgical abortions done at, uh, it looks like, five different uh, clinics in the area. Vancouver, Salem, Southeast Portland, Bend, and Beaverton. Uh, they're done up to 14 weeks. Uh, from what I can tell, they seem to be to my vacuum aspiration. It doesn't specify if it's machine or manual. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And uh, it could possibly be also with dilatation and curatage. Uh, sedation is uh, an option. It doesn't, doesn't seem to be that it's, you, you, I don't know if you pay extra for it or not. Um, there's also what we call the chemical abortion. They call it the medication abortion. It is, avail it is available, as you can see, the different clinics there. It is available up to nine weeks, and it uses RU46 and a prostaglandin. Let's look at it in a little bit more detail. A suction or, or vacuum aspiration, a powerful suction tube. The sharp cutting edge is inserted into, a, into the womb through a dilated cervix. The suction dismembers the body of the developing baby and tears the placenta from the wall of the uterus, sucking blood, amniotic fluid, placental tissue, and fetal parts to a collection bottle. I've, I've, I've always been amazed that when I looked at Planned Parenthood's description of the abortion, they will tell you what goes on there. But they just simply, at one point, they actually had nothing there. It simply said that the, there was a tube inserted, the machine was turned on, and then it was turned off. And you're like, wait a minute, what happened in the middle there? Um, they now actually do say something. They say that the suction device or machine gently empties your uterus. That is, that is the description of what happens when a human being loses its life. Um, you may be given painkillers, uh, antibiotics, sedation. I, I think uh, they do give antibiotics as a, uh, automatically, but I'm not sure. The, the automatic risk, of course, with the surgical abortion is danger of uterine puncture, uh, hemorrhage, infection from retained tissue. There's some other ones. Uh, if you look in your, your program brochure, you'll see that we have two fact sheets from National Right to Life, one on the physical complications of abortion, the other on the, uh, the psychological or social implications of abortion. And uh, there'll be, you can look for more detail there, but these are just some of the immediate ones. Let's now talk about chemical abortion. RU46, prostaglandin. Uh, what happens is a woman takes RU46, which is a synthetic hormone. It blocks the action of progesterone, which directs the body to supply nutrients to the child. Essentially what it is, it's to think of it like a key that uh, um, it fits in the same keyhole, but when you try to turn it, it breaks off. So in other words, you don't, the, the action doesn't happen. You don't get the door open, but you now you can no longer get in the door without some sort of problem. So it goes to all the same binding sites as progesterone does in the body, but when it gets there, instead of sending the signal to the woman's body, hey, there's a baby down here, keep sending the nutrients, the nutrition, we're, gonna, we're building a whole sort of nice little wonderful cocoon that's going to supply this baby with everything it needs. The woman's body can signal that there's nothing going on down here and begins a process of initiating what it thinks is a normal menstrual process. Um, so what happens when the, when the body is, is deprived, the child is deprived of nutrients, the child starves to death. 
and a day or so later, a woman comes in and takes a prostaglandin to stimulate powerful uterine contractions to expel the tiny corpse. Now, it's some, some very interesting things that come up in this. This will be relevant in what we'll talk about in just a minute. When the FDA approved RU46 in 2000, and the uh, last year of Bill Clinton's term in September, uh, right before the election, it, they had actually tried to approve it like four years before, and they kept having problems with the companies that were involved being able to uh, um, uh, meet certain conditions that uh, would ensure that it was manufactured safely and so forth. But the FDA came and they, they put down that it should be under certain circumstances. It was to be done for women up to 49 days pregnant. They were to come in and take the RU46 the first day there at the clinic, come back to the same clinic two days later, and take a second medication, the prostaglandin, um, and then uh, return at, at, at two weeks after the first day for a third follow-up visit. Well, the abortion industry did not like those particular conditions because what it did was it had the women coming to the office too many times. Uh, it, it meant that she might, uh, at one point they even were considering whether she would stay at the clinic for, after taking the uh, RU46 for four hours, begin the process of abortion there. Clinics didn't like that idea. They, they wanted women to be able to go home and take it there and not to come back. So what they were doing was they were changing what they were doing. Instead of saying seven weeks, they made it nine weeks. This is rather simple, basic math here, but what, what happens when you make the deadline, instead of seven weeks, make it nine weeks? you open yourself up to a larger customer base. So that meant they could have more women come in for the chemical abortions. Um, the other thing they did was they said, we don't want them to come back for the second visit. We will give them the prostaglandin, the, in this case, misoprostol. Let them take it at home and have, have their abortion there, not come back to the clinic uh, uh, at all. They, they also, instead of uh, having them, what the FDA said was you take the misoprostol uh, orally, you take it by, by mouth and that would stimulate the contractions and so forth. Well, they said, you know, we, we don't want to do it that way. We, we think that you can get uh, um, maybe less uh, side effects uh, with the, um, if you have it vaginally inserted. So they would, they would have women insert it vaginally in there and uh, instead of that. And, then second, and the last thing they did was, and this is very interesting, the FDA essentially said that you would take um, uh, two pills, or uh, th three pills of the uh, RU46, um, and then you would take, come back later and take two pills of the misoprostol. Some very interesting thing is they, the FDA said that the, the abortion industry didn't like that, so what they did was they said, well, let's just use one RU46 pill and use four of the prostaglandin. And they thought they'd get the same results. Now, there's some very interesting things about that. Why, why would they do that? Misoprostol costs maybe just a couple of dollars a pill at most. It's cheap. On the other hand, RU46 was going for, at the time, I'm not sure what the price is now, for about $90 a pill. So if you were selling, if you were doing it the way the FDA said it, you would end up spending $270, Planned Parenthood or whoever bought them from the company that made it would pay $270 to get those three pills. And that, if you're looking at uh, maybe three, four hundred dollars dollars for the that's not a lot of profit especially if they're going to come back for three visits anyway You've got three office visits there's not a lot of profit margin in that if you switch it though and only offer one RU46 pill and four of the misoprostol all of a sudden you've got a chance to make a lot more money keep the price the same but you make a lot more profit off of it they said that they thought it was just as good or, uh, as 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 that anyway so the industry began to do it that way now what are the ordinary side effects for there again this is for RU46. Heavy, lengthy bleeding. Uh, people don't realize. Do you realize that you actually lose more blood in a chemical abortion with RU46 than you do with a standard vacuum curatage abortion? You bleed more from a chemical abortion than you do from a surgical abortion. Most people are surprised to find that out, but that's part of the whole process and how it works. It comes with substantial pain uh, and cramping. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and there have been some women who have died from taking RE46. Now, why would they go with chemical abortions? First of all, it's a novelty of a new product, a new image. Uh, um, instead of abortion being this part where you have to get up and, and crawl up on a table and uh, open yourself up to this, this awful surgical instruments and so I guess, 
That doesn't have to happen anymore. Supposedly, all you have to do is just come in and take a couple of pills. And uh, there was even a magazine that talked about uh, essentially you take it presto and the, the baby disappears. Um, but the idea is that that's not the reality of it by, by far. But the idea was that you get in a whole new image of abortion as something safe, simple, easy, convenient. Um, there, were, there have been women who came to uh, uh, have abortions with uh, chemical methods and they said, well, you know, th they didn't believe in abortion, but they, but they would do this because it wasn't really an abortion. So you've got even women who are not even clear that they're even having an abortion anymore, at least early on. I don't know if that's still the case. But the idea is that this is something totally different. Somehow it distanced the people's image from the traditional abortion. Something else, no special equipment. You don't have to have uh, the uh, vacuum uh, abortion machine. Um, you might not even have to have a doctor. Now, this is... The, the FDA, when they said, they said it had to be used in the presence, uh, excuse me, in, under the supervision of a physician. There's a big difference between being under the supervision of, of a physician than having actually the physician to be the one who gives the woman the pills. So, for example, if I go by uh, my doctor and I have, a, ha have some, uh, an ear infection or something, and he writes me a prescription for uh, some antibiotic for my ear or something, um, I don't actually have to see my doctor. He can say, well, just come by and pick it up from the nurse's desk. And so even though I don't actually see the doctor, I'm still officially under his authority. I've gotten a prescription from him. So the idea is that the doctor doesn't actually have to be present here as long as whoever gives the woman the pills is operating under his authority. So, for example, you might have, you might have one abortionist, say, in a large major metropolitan area, um, and you might have four or five satellite clinics. Well, officially... As long as they are all under his authority, they can dispense of pills, and he is ultimately responsible. But you can see how that the uh, um, they could still be operating under his authority, uh, under his supervision. It is easier to add to services by doing this. You can see this um, instead of having to bring in a whole new equipment, uh, uh, maybe build an examination room. Um, all you have to do is simply ha have the pills there. Uh, less mess for the clinic. Supposedly, you don't have to deal with disposal of medical waste. Uh, um, you don't have to have all the uh, instruments and all the rest. It's uh, maybe weeping, crying women. I don't know. You, this is less problem for the clinic, and it seems like easier money because all you have to do is pass out the pills.